Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are welcoming back to the show Mr. David Hunter. David is an investment professional and a precious metals expert. He is the chief macro strategist at Contrarian Macro Advisors. David is widely known and he has a stellar reputation as an independent thinker when it comes to finance and to wealth. We are honored to have him on the show today as we are watching what some are calling the very beginning of a silver short squeeze, while others are saying that it is all over. So we are calling upon our resident contrarian to add to his perspective on what is truly happening within the markets. David, welcome back to the show. How are you today? I'm good, Michelle. Thanks for having me on. I love having you here. Your perspectives every time are really interesting because you tend to go the opposite direction of everyone. And most of the time you're right, which is incredible. Well, everybody else is sitting there looking at you like you're crazy. Four months later, they're saying, <laughs> hey, David called it. Right now, the precious metals markets are hot. So let's start there. Um, you have talked about the secular bull market that you have predicted will be accelerating over the next several months. And then you see a future bear market that you see coming, which could be steep. So I want to start right there, David. First of all, when we're talking about the silver short squeeze, did it have any effect upon your predictions that you've made over the last six months or so? Yeah, actually, not at all. Um, I, in fact, in the past week, when you were seeing all over Twitter, uh, people taking on the handle silver squeeze, I said, if I see that one more time, I'm going to start blocking people. So <laughs> um, I just felt it was hype, you know, but um, certainly, um, you know, in the short run, um, there's the narrative out there that uh, the ETFs, the silver ETFs, uh, have a lot of paper and they don't really have the silver to back it. So there's, there's talk about that. There is, there is um, a situation going on with Basel three where they're going to start telling the banks to, um, you know, get their, their silver holdings up. So, so there are, I guess you could say there are potential squeezes there, but in terms of Reddit and, you know, what they could do to, to squeeze the shorts, I, I, I don't think that's real. Um, but yeah, I'm, I am very bullish silver. So whatever drives it, it's, it's going up in my opinion. Everything's good with you. Now, let's define for everyone, David, what a secular bull market is, first of all. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to step back because I, I am a secular bull on the stock market uh, or, or believe we're in a secular bull, but coming to the end of a secular bull. So when I, in my letters and on Twitter, when I talk about secular bull, it's usually in reference to the broader stock market um, because I think we are in the 39th year of a secular bull market that started back in August of 1982 for the stock market. Um, silver and gold are in their own cycles and I'm very bullish both of those. But in terms of when I am talking secular, I'm really referring to the broader stock market. And um, to differentiate a secular bull from a cyclical bull, a secular bull contains many um, sec uh, cyclical bulls. So each cycle, each economic cycle, there's usually a bull market in the equity market to go with it. Um, and a secular um, bull will contain several of those economic cycles and several of those um, cyclical stock market bull cycles. And so we've had since 1982 several um, uh, economic um, upswings and then recessions. Um, and we've had several stock market upswings in that period or, or cyclical bull markets. We are coming to the end of both a cyclical bull market and what I believe is a secular bull market. So we're in the Latter stages, I have been known to be talking about a melt up here because the latter stages of a secular bull typically go parabolic. And that's what we're seeing here is the market just keeps going higher and higher and people go, this has no, you know, this doesn't make sense to me. Well, it, it does if you really step back and understand where you are in a full cycle. Um, in terms of silver and gold, 
Um, I think there uh, we're not coming to an end of a secular bull. I think that runs all the way through the decade. So uh, there's plenty of runway ahead in terms of silver and gold. Uh, stock market, not so much. Wow. Before we leave the topic of precious metals, um, first of all, I want to talk about the impact of the inflation that you see coming upon the precious metals markets specifically. And talk to us about numbers. Where do you see this going, David? Sure. So in the short run, I think we are seeing a, a bit of a burst in inflation, you know, break out from a very long downtrend. So I, I do see over the next several months the, the odds that we're going to see higher inflation and probably push up against 3%, um, maybe a little higher. Um, in, and then you know, I'm calling for a global deflationary bust uh, to begin sometime later this year. So that will take inflation back down into negative territory. So I don't think this is a sustainable inflation move. The one we have now is just a short-term move. However, once we get beyond the global deflationary bust, on the other side of that, we'll have a uh, recovery cycle that I think is going to be uh, industrially driven and uh, inflation driven. And it will be the first inflation cycle we've seen since the 1970s. In that, the inflation could get up to 15, 20 percent or higher. So we're going to go from negative, inf negative inflation or deflation uh, in the next year to uh, potentially 20 percent plus inflation by the end of the decade. Uh, in my opinion. Um, so it'll be something we haven't witnessed in the last 40 years. You know, we peaked out in inflation back in 19, uh, the early 1980s at somewhere around 20%. And uh, I think this will be a full retrace of that. Wow, that's, that, this is um, really interesting um, in terms of investing. Your forecasts are just spectacular because you can almost... Um, guide your investments based upon your forecasts themselves. Now, I want you to go into that a little bit more, please, for us. What kind of breakdown are we looking at deflationary-wise, and what are your best suggestions for the next 10 years? Sure. Um, so the, um, the global deflationary bust is really driven by the fact that we've got so much leverage in the system. You know, we've spent the last many decades really building up um, debt in the system, not only here in the United States, but around the world. So the global debt right now is in excess of $250 trillion. And then on top of that, another form of leverage is a leverage of derivatives. Um, they leverage up uh, financial markets. So you've got two kinds of leverage that are basically at unprecedented levels, nothing even close to these levels have ever been seen before in the world. And so if you get into a situation where you are um, beginning a downturn, that leverage will accelerate that downturn and exacerbate that downturn. And that's what I think we'll see later this year. For a couple of reasons, I'm not a real um, fan of real estate going forward. I think probably for the next few months, next several months, it still continues to, on the housing side, continues strong. But a deflationary bust will take most assets down and down hard. So, um, you know, stocks are going to go down. I have a, an 80% uh, bear market prediction out there. Um, you know, even gold and silver will have a, a, a backup. They won't be nearly as um, negative as, as a stock market. But real estate will get hit along with most assets. And then on the other side of the bust in the next recovery, if, in fact, inflation is going to head towards 20 percent, that means interest rates are going to be heading towards double digits. Uh, it won't happen immediately. The first couple of years out of the, the bust will probably be very gradual increase in inflation and interest rates. So you'll still be in, you know, maybe mid single digits. Um, but the problem is, as rates move towards double digits, that means mortgage rates move towards double digits. That means people's um, when, they, when they typically buy a house today, they're looking at how much can I afford? And the affordability is really very much not only the price of the house, but what's my mortgage rate? What's my mortgage payment going to be? And so if you're going to see double digit mortgage rates somewhere out in the middle of the next of, of this decade, 
um, that's going to be a huge headwind for real estate and put a real damper on prices. So I, I tell people who normally think of real estate as an inflation hedge that I don't think it's going to be much of an inflation hedge in the next cycle because of the rapid rise in rates that I see coming. Um, so, you know, if you have a home, you, you need a home. I'm not certainly out here saying people shouldn't own their homes. Um, but in terms of speculating in real estate, I think I think it's probably not going to be the um, best cycle for it. What do you think is going to be hot? Where's the best place to be? Well, uh, uh, you know, I always tell people I'm a strategist. I'm not a um, you know registered investment advisor, so I cannot give advice. I can't provide investment guidance. I can forecast. So by my forecast, you can tell I like you know I th- I think gold and silver are going to have a huge cycle ahead. So this year, my forecast for gold is 2,500, for silver is somewhere between 45 and 50. And I think we could see those prices in the first half of this year. Um, for for the balance of the decade, um, you know, somewhere out late in the decade, I think you could see gold north of 10,000 and silver north of 300. So they have huge runways ahead. Um, but I also, also caution people, there's that deflationary bust in between. So you have to be careful not to be um, a straight line thinker, a linear thinker here and think I, I don't have anything to worry about because um, as, I, as, as an analogy, I say, if you're standing on the south rim of the Grand Canyon and you're looking across to the north rim and thinking you can just walk straight across, you're in for a shock. You know, there's this this thing called the Grand Canyon in between. Well, it's the same thing with gold and silver. If you, you know, if you uh, own it today on the basis that it's going to be um, 10,300, you know, seven or eight years from now, understand there's a big canyon between here and say 2022 or three um, that, you know, could, could take them back down, you know, 30%. So, um, so you have to be, you know, some people may want to own it and just hold it right through that. That's their choice. I'm just saying don't be uh, unaware of the fact that there's, um, there's a trough in between or a correction in between. Okay. So according to your forecast, buying the dip might be a great thing because you're expecting it to go down before it starts to go up. Yeah, I'm not, like I said, I can't give any advice. So people have to figure that out on their okay. own in terms of what their <laughs> risk profiles are. Um, you know, some some would rather kind of just average in or buy gradually and others might want to try the time. And it's really, it's an individual choice. Okay. Now I want to ask you a question. Um, your forecasts, as I mentioned at the top of the show, um, you tend to go, you are, of course, a contrarian, so you tend to go the opposite of the crowd. And you're doing it based upon the exact same data that other economic forecasters are using, which I find very interesting. So when you're looking at the economic landscape to determine what you see, what is your strategy upon reading the data that brings you to your conclusions? Sure. Uh, obviously, different people have different forecasts of the economy, you know, different opinions on where it's going. So that's, you know, 47 years of doing this. I feel pretty comfortable with my abilities to forecast the economy. But in terms of forecasting markets, you have to take into account um, the fact that markets are discount um, functions so that they discount the future. And you have to kind of decide or, or through analysis determine where, you know, what's being factored into the prices right now. Not only what do I think the economy is going to do, but really what's, what's sentiment? You know, so I, as I say, I use technical analysis. I use fundamental analysis. I use macro analysis and cross market analysis. But then probably the very big differentiator is I look at sentiment. And for example, last March when the market, fell so dramatically over 30% in, in three weeks, um, everybody got bearish. And I looked at the sentiment and it was at levels that it rarely gets to. 
So I said, this is a fake out. This isn't the real bear market. The bear market's out in the future. And I got very bullish. And I also knew that, you know, the um, Federal Reserve was going to come in with both feet uh, because they told us they were going to. And so you had this huge uh, liquidity surge uh, along with um, fiscal um, expansion that helped uh, provide a wind at your back. So, you know, every, every um, cycle is different, but that's kind of what, what drove my work back last March. Where are we right now in terms of the overall markets? When you see the big picture, talk to us about it. Sure. Yeah, I think, as I said before, I think we're in the late stages of a 38, almost 39-year bull market, secular bull market. And I think that's going to come to an end potentially in the first half of this year when you're talking about 39 years it's hard to pinpoint no you know i could be wrong and it might stretch out for you know several more months beyond that but at least right now my best guess would be that we're going to see a top in the in the secular bull market in the first half of this year and i think it's going to end in a parabolic we're basically in that parabolic now that means the market just keeps going up and up and up and you get very any any pullbacks are very short and sharp, um, and uh, you know I have a target out there for the S and P. I just raised it in the last uh, week. Uh, my target is forty six hundred, and I think we'll be there in a matter of months. Um, my target on the Nasdaq is seventeen thousand, and again similar timing, and the Dow Jones I think can get to thirty seven thousand, and and I'm not sure I'm even optimistic enough. I mean, it it may be that I'm still a little too conservative. I think we're close to the end, but when you're in that parabolic, you know, it can go wherever wherever it wants to go. So if it wants to overshoot by a couple hundred points on the S&P, it could very well do that. But, you know, best I can tell, it's somewhere in that ballpark. So you see the last half of the year economically very different than the first half. Yeah, it's funny because, as you know, the street probably thinks the second half is where you're going to have the strength. Um, And I actually think, I'm not sure whether it's third quarter or fourth quarter, but I think somewhere in the second half, the economy starts really running into trouble. Um, I think second quarter is going to be strong. I think third quarter may be relatively strong um, because of the, the vaccine and economy opening up. But I also think because of that inflation surge we're getting, ultimately the Fed it may have to lean against the winds here. If you, if you see the stock market up around 4,600 on the S&P and you see inflation pushing 3% uh, and you see people you know, taking on risks um, like junk bonds and things, which we're seeing right now where they're pushing those to the, to the highs, I think at some point the Fed's going to say, hey, maybe we overdid this. You know, now the economy is opening up. We have to worry that we're, we're pouring too much fuel on this fire. And I think you could actually see the Fed tighten um, towards the middle of the year. And if you see that, um, that's probably a signal that the stock market's going to start running into trouble. Now, keep in mind, the stock market will lead, typically anyway, it leads the economy. So you could have the top in the stock market in the second quarter and have the economy strong into the, you know, until you get to the fourth quarter. So um, it doesn't mean the bust starts immediately when the stock market rolls over. The stock market may roll over on the basis of tightening, and yet the economy may still have legs until you get into the fourth quarter. Um, yeah, that I can't tell. Talk to us about the bust. Um, talk to us about what does that look like? Yeah, I, I coined the phrase global deflationary bust, you know, putting those three words together. They're three words that are used all the time, but putting them together several years ago. I said, when this cycle ends, it will end in a global deflationary bust. Again, we haven't had a deflationary downturn since the Great Depression. So that was 80 plus years ago. Um, And we're not about to have another drawn out depression here. So I define bust as 
um, something that's got the magnitude of a depression in some ways, but happens at the speed of a recession uh, or even faster sometimes. So you could have all the damage done to the economy contained within a year, but it could be the most damage we've seen in, in you know, since the Great Depression. So, you know, it'll, it'll be very fast. In other words, we're relatively fast, but very steep. And part of it, as I say, the bus really started last March with the pandemic um, because we shut down the economy. You know, the, the economy dropped on an annual basis more than 30%. That's pretty much a definition of a bust. So we had that in the second quarter, but then we had this, you know, massive um, liquidity pump, not only here, but around the world. And so then your third quarter was up 33%. On an annualized basis, so you had, you know, you had the first step of the bust in the second quarter, but then, you know, because of fiscal and monetary stimulus um, and relief, you were able to kind of postpone any further bust. So I call what's coming later this year the second shoe dropping on the bust or second stage of the bust. It's not a new bust. It's all part of the same thing. The pandemic really was the trigger. Um, the massive debt and the massive leverage is really the reason it won't be a recession. It'll be a bust. Um, and then, you know, sometime probably middle of next year, you begin recovery and that recovery will carry you into, you know, the latter half of this decade. Great. So it doesn't, it's not a long drawn out. Um, I don't want to be like, oh, that's great, but at least it's not a drawn out situation. So if you can make it through and you can be prepared for it, things could be good at the other side. Of yeah, it. that's the, the good news is it's not, it's not a, you know, decade long depression like we saw in the thirties. Um, the bad news is it will feel a lot longer than it is while we're going through it, just like this pandemic's felt you know, long. <laughs> um, when you add to the pandemic, you know, um, a surge in bankruptcies, and I think we're going to have a, a big involuntary debt liquidation cycle where both on the corporate side and on the individual side, you're going to see a lot of bankruptcies um, and some major bank failures around the world. Uh, while you're going through it, you're going to be worried about is this, you know, when are we ever going to see a recovery? So, so a year can feel like an eternity when it's pretty negative, And that's what I think we're going to have. Um, but yes, the good news is um, because of um, what the Fed and central banks around the world, as well as the governments will be doing, we will have a recovery probably within a year of, of the start of the bust and, and maybe sooner than that. So. Great, great. You know what, David, I want to get your thoughts on um, green technology and artificial intelligence and the new cutting edge tech that's coming out probably, very probably within this decade, um, if not the next few years. What kind of economic impact globally would that have? Sure. Well, you're talking to you know, a 69-year-old dinosaur. So um, there's probably better people to opine on this. But uh, I, I will say on the, uh, on the green energy, it's coming. I mean, there's no question that obviously a Biden administration is, is going to push it harder than, than the Trump administration would have. Um, and so, and, and there's certainly a lot of, around the world, a lot of um, a desire for it. So it's coming. Um, but I don't think it's coming nearly as fast as, you know, the rhetoric has you believe, because we just can't replace uh, fossil fuels with alternative energy that fast. So, yes, we'll have electric cars. Yes, we'll have um, alternative energy. But you're still going to have a an economy driven uh, uh, with fossil fuels as the dominant fuel for at least this decade into the next decade. So, so I think people need to kind of put the brakes on a little bit with what, um, you know, what green energy is and what it can do. It, it, you know, it just can't, there's no way they can replace the demand for energy that we're going to have in, 
you know, coming up in the next recovery. And, and by the way, as I said, it was where it's going to be the first industrial recovery um, uh, since the seventies. And so, you know, all our cycles since, you know, 82 have been consumer driven. Well, I think what we're going to see in the 2022 to 2030 period is an industrial driven um, cycle. And that, demands a lot more energy. You, you can have factories, you know, operating at higher capacities than they have in the last 30, 40 years. You're going to have uh, a lot of infrastructure building and, and a lot of demand for commodities. So energy is going to have to re still rely on oil and gas. And so I am, I'm a big bull on oil and gas in the next cycle. Um, doesn't mean you won't have growth in the green energy. You certainly are going to. That could be, you know, a, a very big rewarding area for investors. That's not where you know, I'm, I'm focused, but um, uh, I would just caution people. Uh, we're not going, we're not going, uh, you know, 70, 80 percent green energy anytime soon. Um, and, you know, the politicians like to push it. Uh, it, it works. But in reality, you know, it, it's something that evolves. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not a revolution. It's going to happen overnight. Um, in terms of um, artificial intelligence, again, I'm not an expert there at all. All I'll say is it's certainly an area that is getting a lot of attention and a lot of capital. And so you can only assume it's going to be a big growth engine for the next cycle. David, what are your thoughts about cryptos? Uh, my thoughts are pretty, pretty much non-thoughts. As I tell people, I don't follow it. Um, I have no plans to follow it. Um, it's not necessarily that I'm negative on it, but I, I am skeptical because it has not been through um, one cycle yet. Uh, it's um, you know kind of got a cult-like following, uh, very much a momentum um you know, investment at this point. So, you know, very you know, momentum driven. Those aren't great characteristics for, you know, longevity. Um, so I'd like to see how it holds up in the bust. And I am concerned again, I'm not an expert. I don't follow it at all, but it does seem like, um, you know, unlike gold or silver that have finite uh, supplies, you know, this is something where, uh, I'm, I, you know, it's somewhat of a contrived supply demand story, in my opinion. And, and it does seem that it's uh, gained a lot of its following because of all the skepticism over institutions. You know, there's, um, you know, people are pretty negative on the Fed and central banks in general, pretty negative on governments and, you know, how they control our lives. And so Bitcoin feels like, hey, here's a way around that. And so that's kind of driven the narrative. And I, I'm just not sure it has that kind of uh, staying power, you know, and, and you do governments, governments could, could certainly impact its future. So I think for all those reasons, um, I would just caution people that it's, it's not a given, you know, it's not a something that, you know, you're going to have a lot of people pumping it and pushing it and telling you uh, because it's had, you know, a great run certainly in the last uh, six months. Um, and I, I just am somewhat leery of, of um, you know, something that's driven more by momentum than anything else. Yeah, a lot of talk there. When you spoke about the AI and the, the green revolution, and um, even though I do believe they are coming, I don't think it's nearly as fast. I totally, mm -hmm. I totally understand what you're saying, but I was, it brought up the cryptos in my mind because that seems to be, you know, oh, cryptos, everybody seems to run, you know, anytime anybody says this is hot, you know, everybody runs in that direction and then this is hot, runs in that direction, <laughs> a lot of running yeah, around I, I going just, on. I just remi remind people, not that, not that crypto is in this category, but I just remind right. people GameStop was $400 a week ago. It's now 49. So, I mean, you know, momentum attracts momentum, but it also works in both directions. Right. So you can make a lot of money, but just be careful, careful, careful. You can make a lot of money in momentum. You can lose a lot of money in momentum. So. Exactly. David, let's talk about employment. Um, 
In this kind of economic atmosphere, what is your perspective on the current jobs market? Where do you see the opportunities developing from and what would be your best advice? Okay, yeah, if, you, if you're talking about you know, young people and career planning, um, I tell people, um, you know, I get, I get a lot of this on, on Twitter. People will direct message me and say, um, can you tell me what books I should read so I can do what you do the way you do it? So I go, well, this really built up over 47 years of experience. And, you know, I did a lot of reading early in, on in my career and all of that. But um, it's, you know, some of it's God-given, some of it's experience, and some of it's book learning. But, you know, it's not something where there's a formula to it or there's, you know, there's lots of people that have been around 40 years that still don't forecast very well. So it's not, it's not all that. But, um, but so I'll tell people, don't, you know, everybody wants to jump into or the people that, you know, contact me want to jump into the financial markets and into, you know, becoming a, an investment guru or what have you. Uh, I say the future for finance is not as bright as you might think. You know, if, if we're running into a world where you have a global bust and then you have hyperinflation, um, and what may come after that hyperinflation may not be very pretty. It may be more drawn out and very uh, troublesome. You know, we're, we're, we've had basically 40 years of building what I call a Ponzi scheme, you know, what, with all the leverage in the system. Um, that Ponzi scheme at some point is going to really break apart. And so I'm not sure finance is, is the future, uh, you know, uh, always go go with what you love. You know, if you're really a numbers person, you really love this. Uh, I don't want to discourage people. There's still, you know, there's still going to be a place for people in finance, but it's not going to be the kind of landscape we've had of late. Um, and if I were, you know, if I were 20 years old today and looking out, I or maybe 18 and looking out, I think I'd go to Colorado School of Mines and become an engineer in the mining field, because I think if we're going to have 20% uh, inflation rates in the next decade, and it's going to be driven by commodities, uh, and particularly precious metals are going to do as well as I think they're going to do, it's going to be a huge demand for um, people in the mining industry in terms of engineers and, and people that can, um, you know, find, find what is going to be a much harder thing to mine you know the the easy mining has taken place as the price moves up you'll be able to justify you know mining that's not as concentrated etc but you know i'm far from an engineer myself but that's where i think uh there's going to be you know some future um and and again technology of all kinds is going to continue to grow um we're you know we're it's just amazing the kind of progress we are making in terms of technological um, improvements and changes. So, so, you know, but most probably the biggest advice I just gave to somebody today he was wondering where to steer his daughter um, and thinking of finance. And I said, tell her, tell her to figure out what she loves to do and, and focus on that. Don't try to steer her. If she loves science, you know, let her, choose something in that direction or math, something in that direction. If she loves English, go in that direction. But, you know, don't, don't think it's, you know, let's figure out where we can make money and go, go, go where your heart is. And, and I think your success will follow. Right. Right. Your instincts will tell you where you should be headed mm -hmm. and that'll guide you along. Now, um, in closing, so your thoughts about, you know, we've been hit with the pandemic and we've been hit with, you know, all the economic shutdowns and all of this. So you don't see this as hugely impactful upon the forecast that you've had and held over the last several years. That's what I'm hearing here. You don't seem to have hugely changed because of this impact. So do you think that the pandemic is short lived and we'll just sort of ride along the crash that you see coming and then out of it that you see coming? Yeah, I guess I'd say um, the macro 
overwhelms everything else. I mean, I, I we are just in such a unusual period in terms of the the massive amount of of debt and money that's been pumped into the system over over decades, and and it's accelerated. Um, and and I I use the term super cycle to define even the bigger cycle than a secular cycle is that super cycle between two depressions. I think we could have a depression in the 2030s and we had a depression in the 1930s. So that hundred years in between is the super cycle. So I think to some extent we're, you know, we're in the latter stages, the last 10 years of say a super cycle. Um, and as a result of that, that kind of dominates, you know, the macro dominates but by no means do I think this pandemic is small or, or uh, inconsequential. I, I think um, part of the bust, I didn't know it when I was talking about a bust before the pandemic, but the pandemic was really the trigger for the bust. Like I said, the debt and, and the excesses out there, we were going to have a bust no matter what. It was a matter of what was going to trigger it. I think the pandemic came along and did that. Um, so it's it definitely influencing um, the cycle and influencing my forecast. But I do think we come out the other side of it and it's more macro that's going to be driving things. Um, you know, a lot of the inflation, the bust is going to create a huge um, response from the governments of the world and from the central banks of the world in terms of money. You know, I've said before, um, I may have said it on our last interview. I think the the, cent, uh, the Fed's balance sheet, which is currently a little over seven trillion, can grow to you, it will be above twenty trillion within probably a year to eighteen months as a result of the bust. In other words, that will be what it will take, and it might even be as high as thirty trillion. That's what it will take to pull a free falling financial system back out of that spin. And so that that's what I mean by the macro uh, overwhelms anything else is those numbers are just, we throw around trillions like it's no big deal, but you know, to increase the balance sheet, you know, the balance sheet in 2008 was only, you know, just over 850 billion. And we're now at 7 trillion and I'm talking about it growing in the next 18 months to 20 to 30 trillion. I mean, those are numbers that just are mind boggling. And I don't think, I don't think we really, nobody can get their arms around that. I mean, it just, it's a number that is just out there. Um, so maybe I'll be wrong about the magnitude, but I think it's going to be big. And as a result, that will overwhelm, but, but make no mistake. The pandemic was part of the reason we have the bust. And so the response to that will be money, but the pandemic was playing a role. It's very interesting. That's what, even though you're a contrarian and you're the opposite of what most people that I hear speak, on that point, everyone is almost in unison that we were headed for something huge simply because of the extraordinary money printing that was going on, all of the debt everywhere, that the only question was what would trigger it. So instead of the pandemic really changing anything, it turned into the trigger for what was coming anyway. Yeah, I will be honest, though, I think most of those people saying that today, we're not saying that a year ago or two years ago, they're Johnny come lately to this scenario. Yeah, they'll talk about it now as if they always saw it coming, but I was I was ridiculed tremendously for calling for a bust. I mean, it was it was not something that most people believed was coming. Now there was you know there certainly was a a, a, a crowd out there, a small crowd, um, particularly in the Austrian camp, um, that talked about this could be the end of it. You know, the, uh, as I say, the difference between me and the real gloom and doomers. Um, that we're talking about this is, you know, we're coming to something that may end, you know, be the end of it as we know it um, in terms of the economy on you know, the long depression. The difference between me and them is I, I think we have this short bust. And then because the Fed will have unlimited, Fed and central banks will have unlimited ability to print, we have one more cycle before you get to that real gloom and gloom, gloom and doom scenario. So 
So there was those people were out there, but a lot of other people have now joined the um, the crowd in terms of saying, "Oh yeah, you know this was we we knew a bust was coming." Or we knew, <laughs> I yeah. saw it though. No, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I just want to nutshell this once for everyone. So what you see is um, we're doing great until maybe the third, fourth quarter, and then we're going to have a crash that's short lived. Um, maybe a year, year and a half. And then you see um, the Fed taking over uh, and we go very well throughout the rest of the decade. Something that you've talked about that kind of has me a little worried is after 2030, because then you see a legitimate reaction to everything we've done. That's when we really start to pay the price on this huge debt. And I just want you to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, let me let me just clarify the for this year, you know, I I people need to separate stock market from economy. My stock market view is that we could top out sometime in the second quarter. Um, it doesn't have to, it could extend, but my best guess is that we top out sometime in the second quarter. The economy, because the stock market typically leads the economy by many months, may not really start showing the reason the stock market is topping out for until, say, fourth quarter. So I don't know that. It might start sooner. But I just want to separate those two. Um, and so, yes, the stock market will begin a bear market once that top is in. Um, and so you could have, you know, a top. April, May, June, uh, and the stock market may still be okay and look strong until fourth quarter. So um, that that can throw people off because they, they like to think of stocks and, and the economy as one and the same. So then um, beyond that, to try to wrap this up quickly, because um, I know you're on time constraints, um, beyond that, then we have a recovery cycle I don't think the stock market gets back to its high. So let's say 4,600 is a high on the S&P. You can have a strong stock market in say 2022 to 2027 or eight, um, but it will be coming from that trough, let's say an 80% decline. I don't know whether it'll be 70 or 80% or something big. So let's say we get to 4,600, then we have an 80% correction. That takes you down to say a thousand on the S and P, um, or just below a thousand. You could have a um, tripling of the S and P from that trough, um, from the bottom of the bear market, and only be back to three thousand, right? And and if we topped out at forty six hundred, you know your your top in the next decade might be three or three thousand thirty five hundred. So a lower high, and that's what the secular bear is, is over several cycles, lower highs, lower lows. So um, so that doesn't mean there's not gonna be opportunities on the other side of the bust, but just understand for somebody in an index fund, um, if that index fund goes, you know, an S&P index fund goes to 4,600, they may never get back to that level again, right? Um, so even though, you know, from the bottom you do well, you may never get back to the level you get to in the first half of this year. So, so it's important for people to understand um, secular peaks means going forward, you may not see the, you may not revisit the highs. Um, once we get through the next decade with inflation moving towards, you know, high double digits, and interest rates moving towards high double digits and, a, and a, a debt in the system that will even be higher. So if we're at 250 trillion now, we could be at 350 or 400 trillion by the end of the decade. How do you finance that? You can finance that when rates are one or 2%. How do you finance that if rates are at 10, 12, 14, 15%? You can't. I mean, the math doesn't work out. So at some point, the Fed, as well as other central banks, um, you know, the, the governments are going to be at a point where they can't fund their debt. They can't, they can't keep piling on new debt, you know, the, uh, the, which is really getting at MMT, you know, this modern 
monetary theory where you can They're have your brilliant. cake and eat it too. <laughs> MMT, <laughs> just yeah. keep printing. Yeah. You can right. you can spend you know spend government money all day long because you know you just float some more debt and pay for the you know to service the debt. That works when you have very low interest rates. It doesn't work when inflation takes over and all of a sudden rates are moving up very quickly. Our government, as well as the governments around the world, are going to run into a situation where they cannot fund their debt. They can't service it. And we're going to find out in this country, because we haven't for the last you know, many, many decades, that when the, when the Treasury can't just say, I'm going to float another bond, you know, we need more money, when, that, when they can no longer go to the capital market because the capital market says, you're a bad risk, we're not buying your bonds anymore, all of a sudden, our standard of living is going to plunge because, um, you know, we don't have we don't have anywhere to take from. <laughs> There's no more just you know free money out there, um, and with interest rates and inflation towards the end of the decade way up, it it really is much higher risk of something really unforeseen and and a, an unwind that can you know, lead to a true crash, you know, where things just come tumbling down. And I don't, I don't pretend to know what comes on the other side of that. Uh, but I don't think it, it just doesn't look like you can solve that puzzle easily. And so I think, you know, many, many decades of um, borrowing leads to at least a decade or two of payback period where you, you operate at far, far below potential. So I think the 30, 2030s and maybe beyond is a period that, you know, people are just going to have to get used to a lot less. Wow. But as I tell people really quick, um, focus on the here and now, because that's a forecast and it's a long-term forecast. And, you know, don't lose sleep over something that's, you know, may never happen. It's it's what I see right now, but you know, let's focus on the next several years, not, you know, ten years out. Right. Right. Because the next several years just look spectacular with everything that's happening. We never know what could change, but we do indeed have a problem uh with all the debt and what it's gonna take to get us through it. So this is gonna be very, very interesting, right? Where are you focused investment-wise? You said that wasn't where you were focused in green energy. Where are you focused? Precious metals? Well, like, like I said, I can't, I can't provide advice. And talking about where I'm focused is a form of advice. So I stay away from that. But what I can say is just from a forecasting standpoint, I think the precious metals you know, have a huge runway ahead. Uh, commodities in general are going to be, I think, the leaders of the next cycle. Um, so everything from ag commodities to metals to, um, you know, the steels and, the um, you know, the uh, rare earths and everything, I think you're going to see, and, and particularly energy, I think the, the period after the bust is going to be a commodity cycle like we've never seen. Um, so I guess that, that, tells you what I think of, of our next decade. Wonderful, wonderful. David, this has been an amazing interview. It's always spectacular to have you here. Please tell everyone where they can go to follow your work. Sure. Probably the best thing is to follow me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at Dave H. Contrarian. Um, and uh, if you um, are interested, I also do have a quarterly investment letter um, that I put out. Um, it, it is by subscription, so it's the, you know there's a cost to it. Um, but if people are interested in that, if they just uh, go to Twitter and direct message me, I'll get back to them on uh, you know the details of that. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. This is going to be an amazing time, right, to watch. <laughs> Yeah, it definitely uh, won't be won't be boring. I don't think <laughs> it won't be boring, Mr. David Hunter, investment professional, precious metals expert, and chief macro strategist at the Contrarian Macro Advisors for the Industry Experts Panel. I'm Michelle Holiday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. 